Hello everyone. In this video about the Alec Manassian trial, I'm going to be looking at Alec Manassian's statements to police and to some of the doctors assessing him and offering my analysis about the role that having autism has played in his actions. I have autism myself and experienced many of the same challenges that Alec Manassian did, so that puts me in a position to offer useful commentary about what's going on. As I explained in my first video, Alec Manassian has pleaded not criminally responsible, or NCR, for committing the van attack. The only defense witness who supports this plea is an American psychiatrist named Alexander Westfall, who is arguing that Manassian's autism prevented him from understanding that what he did was wrong. Manassian's guilt or innocence hinges on whether the court accepts what Dr. Westfall has to say about how autism affected his state of mind when he committed the Toronto van attack. If Manassian's NCR defense is successful, he will be indefinitely committed to a mental hospital and could possibly be released one day. If it fails, he will likely spend the rest of his life in jail. Dr. Westfall's claim that Manassian didn't know that what he was doing was wrong because he has autism has outraged autism advocacy groups and created a great deal of confusion for the public. One of the reasons for this is that in his interview with police, Manassian told the detective that he did what he did because he was a member of the incel movement, he was angry with women for not sleeping with him, and he wanted to shake the foundations of society so that society would do what he and the other incels wanted. This suggests that he knew what he was doing was wrong and that that was the point. To make matters even more bizarre, Dr. Westfall revealed in court that Alec Manassian had told him, I knew what I did was morally wrong. So here's Manassian explicitly saying to Dr. Westfall that he knew the difference between right and wrong and knew what he did was wrong. Yet Dr. Westfall is still claiming that Alec Manassian is NCR because he didn't understand that what he did was wrong. As bizarre and incomprehensible as this may seem, Westfall's argument makes some sense if you understand the effects that having autism can have on people, although I still don't agree with his conclusion. My goal with this video is to help people understand why Dr. Westfall believes what he does, and why I think he's wrong. I also want to help people understand some of the social challenges that people with autism face, and how having autism can make people more at risk of being radicalized by internet groups like incels. The link between autism and extremism is still a poorly understood subject, and there aren't many people with autism who are speaking out about the problems they have that could make people more vulnerable to extremism or to criminal behavior. In order to do all of this, I'm going to have to talk about some complicated subjects in psychology. I've tried very hard to make this material easy to understand by people watching this video, but I'm still going to have to provide a lot of background information on the challenges that people with autism have in order for what I'm saying to make sense. I'm also going to be talking about some of my own experiences with autism and relating it to what people like Elliot Roger and Alec Manassian have experienced. Now, the first thing we need to understand is why Dr. Westfall would disregard Manassian's statements about how he knew what he did was wrong and choose to say that he's NCR anyway. Well, Westfall is arguing that although Alec Manassian understands that society says murder is wrong, his autism is severe enough that he doesn't understand why this is. In his view, Manassian's ability to understand the minds of other people and to empathize with them is so limited that he is only able to think of society's rules in a disconnected intellectual way, without a sufficient understanding of their effects or consequences. Central to this argument is two things that people with autism tend to have problems with, empathy and theory of mind. I'm going to explain how both of these things are defined in psychology, how they affect people with autism, and how I think they affected Alec Manassian. I'm then going to talk about whether I think Dr. Westfall's conclusions are reasonable. I'm going to start with empathy because it's easier to understand and because most of us know what empathy is. The fact that Alec Manassian murdered 10 innocent people that he had never met might suggest that he doesn't have empathy. However, the problem is a little more complicated than that. The psychological definition of empathy differs slightly from what the word empathy means in everyday language. Psychologists divide empathy into two categories, cognitive empathy and affective empathy. Cognitive empathy is the ability to understand what other people are feeling. For example, you can recognize that a person is sad when they're crying, and you understand what's going on with them that is making them sad, and you can understand why someone in their situation would be sad. This is similar to what we know as sympathy. Affective empathy means having an emotional reaction to what other people are feeling. For example, if you see another person feeling sad, it makes you feel sad as well. This is what we commonly refer to as empathy. Empathy is divided into these two categories because a person can have one type of empathy but not the other, or different degrees of both. A person also needs both types of empathy in order to be able to actually empathize with others. A sociopath or a psychopath has cognitive empathy but no affective empathy. They can recognize when other people are suffering, but they don't care. They might even enjoy seeing other people suffering or enjoy inflicting suffering on others. This is known as sadism. When we think of psychopaths, whether it's real psychopaths like Paul Bernardo or psychopaths in popular culture like Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs or Patrick Bateman from American Psycho, this is what they're like. A person with autism has effective empathy. When they recognize that other people are feeling a certain way, they'll feel it themselves. Some people with autism even have above average levels of effective empathy, to the point where seeing other people upset will really bother them. However, people with autism have problems with cognitive empathy. 
Their ability to read the thoughts and emotions of others is impaired, and so they might not recognize whenever another person is feeling a certain way. In order to empathize with someone, you first need to know what they're feeling. In other words, you need to have cognitive empathy in order for effective empathy to occur. This is an important distinction because both sociopaths and people with autism can fail to show empathy in a situation where most people would, but it's for entirely different reasons. A sociopath knows what other people are feeling, but doesn't care. A person with autism cares if other people are feeling a certain way, but has trouble recognizing when it's happening. If a person with autism gets the help they need and learns to recognize the thoughts and emotions of others, they can function normally in society. However, there is no known effective cure or treatment for sociopathy or psychopathy. It's important to recognize that autism and sociopathy are not mutually exclusive. A person can have both at the same time, and this can make it difficult for mental health professionals to tell what behavior or attitude is being caused by what. As for why people with autism can fail to understand what other people are thinking and feeling, there are several reasons for this. One of these reasons has to do with the ability to read body language and other nonverbal cues, such as gestures, tone of voice, and eye movements. In a person with autism, the ability to perceive this type of information is impaired. Most people learn how to do these things intuitively, but a person with autism has to be taught them explicitly, similar to how you might learn a second language like French or Spanish. People with autism often feel like there's kind of an invisible textbook of social rules and information that everybody automatically learns except them, and it's frustrating if nobody is willing to teach them that information. One example is the ability to read emotions by looking at a person's eyes. One of the tests for autism is known as the eye test, which was designed by an autism researcher named Simon Baron Cohen. It consists of 36 black and white pictures of a person's eyes, with four possible choices for what emotion the person is expressing. The pictures cover the range of basic emotions that people experience, and only one of the choices for each picture is correct. The test is scored out of 30. A normal or neurotypical person will generally score over 20 on this test. A person with autism will generally score lower than 20, meaning they have a harder time recognizing what other people are feeling by looking at their eyes. Now, I have autism and I've taken this test. Unfortunately, I never got the help that I needed when I was a kid, and I ended up having to help myself by reading things on the internet. I heard about the eye test and took it when I was around 14. I scored 4 out of 30, which was a very bad score. I could recognize fear, surprise, anger, and sadness, but nothing else. I kept all of the slides on my computer, and I studied them until I was able to intuitively understand what emotion was shown in each of the pictures. I became better at reading other people and empathized more because I was able to understand more of what was going on. When I started getting the help I needed as an adult and took the test officially, I scored over 20 and fell within the normal range of scores. One of the reasons I'm mentioning this is because it's important to understand that people with autism can learn to overcome many of their issues. A low score on something like the eye test doesn't necessarily mean that a person has to be stuck that way forever. People with autism also have a hard time reading tone of voice and body language, so they might not be able to pick up on other nonverbal cues that show how a person is feeling. When it comes to understanding the words people say, they often interpret what is said literally and may not detect undertones or nuances in what people are saying that show that they feel a certain way. They may also fail to recognize things like sarcasm, hyperbole, or mockery. We can see this in Alec Manassian's own life history. Manassian was bullied in high school, and one of the things the bullies did was tell him to make weird noises and say strange things. Manassian thought they were doing this because they liked him and found him interesting. He didn't understand that they were mocking him, and his inability to read nonverbal cues was probably part of the reason why. So, now that I've explained how psychologists define empathy and some of the social challenges people with autism face, let's consider the question of whether Manassian has empathy. Alec Manassian drove his van down a busy street in Toronto, killing 10 people and injuring 16. So, he hit 26 people with his van. Imagine what this must have looked like from his perspective. There were people panicking and running out of the way. There would have been people screaming in pain as they were run over by his van, as they rolled off his windshield, and as they were knocked out of the way. He might have seen the terror in some of his victims' faces as they saw the van bearing down on them. We know he was lucid and aware during the attack because he recounted it in great detail to police during his interview. I'm thinking that uh, this is it. I see all these people. It's uh, time to uh, go for it. Time to go for it. And what do you do? I uh, floor the pedal, yeah. I speed the van towards them, and I uh, allow the van to uh, collide with them. Okay. And then what happens? Uh, some people get knocked out of the way, some people roll o over the top of the van. Okay. And then what, what happens? I uh, continue doing that. So, Alec Manassian saw everything that happened. He ran over people, like 94-year-old Betty Forsyth, watched them suffer and die, and didn't care. He didn't feel sorry. He kept going. You might have noticed that Manassian seemed excited in that last clip. Here's what he had to say about how he felt when he was asked by the detective. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling good. Okay. 
10 people died here today. Um, 15 people were seriously injured. Um, I think it's important to ask how you feel about that. I feel like uh, I accomplished my mission. You feel like you accomplished your mission? Yes. I'm feeling good, he says. No guilt, no remorse. He accomplished his mission. Now, the fact that he was able to do what he did and not care might suggest that he is a sociopath or a psychopath. In his assessment of Alec Manassian, Dr. Westfall administered a psychopath test known as the PCLR, which used to be known as the Hair Psychopathy Checklist. Alec Manassian scored 13 out of 40 on it, which is well below the threshold for sociopathy or psychopathy. Westfall is arguing that Manassian's apparent lack of concern for his victims was a result of him not being able to empathize with them because he has autism, and not because he's a sociopath or a psychopath. One of the things worth pointing out here is that the PCLR isn't a perfect litmus test for whether someone is a bad person or not. A person can be completely evil and not score high on this test. The accuracy of the test is also limited by what information the psychologist using it has, and whether he chooses to believe what the offender tells him. As an example, Carla Homolka, who helped her boyfriend Paul Bernardo rape and murder teenage girls in Ontario in the 1990s, scored 5 out of 40 on this test, 8 points lower than Alec Manassian. How much of this is the result of manipulation and how much of it is the result of the test's inadequacy remains a subject of debate. Now, when a person's ability to empathize is impaired, they're going to recognize primitive emotions much more readily than more complex ones. If you recall my own score on the eye test when I was 14, I was able to recognize emotions like fear, surprise, anger, and sadness, but not more complex emotions like shame, contempt, embarrassment, or arrogance. In order for Westfall's analysis to be accurate, Manassian's cognitive empathy would have had to be too impaired to recognize the terror or shock in his victims and therefore not have the knee-jerk, don't do that response, that having effective empathy would give him. He would have had to be too impaired to recognize one of the most extreme displays of one of the most basic emotions people have. So either Alec Manassian's cognitive empathy is at the level of a two-year-old, or there's something else going on here. Of course, you can have all the empathy in the world and still choose to hurt people if you want to. Terrorists will go out and kill people they know are innocent in pursuit of their political or ideological goals. Thinking that the people you're hurting deserve it also has a way of inhibiting what empathy you do have. There are many people who think Alec Manassian is a terrorist, that he hated women, knew what he was doing was wrong, and that he chose to kill people in pursuit of his political or ideological goals, those of the incel movement. I'm now going to talk about theory of mind. As I mentioned earlier, you need to have cognitive empathy in order to have effective empathy and empathize with people. You also need to have theory of mind to develop cognitive empathy. So what is theory of mind? Unless you're a psychologist, you probably aren't familiar with this term. Out of all of the things I'm going to talk about in this video, theory of mind is the hardest concept to articulate or understand. It even confused some of the court reporters who were covering this case, but I'll give it a shot here. Theory of mind has to do with how well you understand how the minds of other people work. Normally, as people develop, their ability to understand the minds of other people becomes more sophisticated and they get closer and closer to understanding what other people are truly like. A newborn baby isn't able to understand that anything outside of himself exists. When his mother's breast appears for him to nurse from, it's something that just seems to appear as if by magic. As children get older, they come to understand that other people are people just like them, with their own thoughts and emotions, their own perspectives, their own preferences, and their own stories. They can then imagine what it's like to be another person, and can understand and predict their behavior based on that information. They come to realize that other people are just as important as they are, and all of this is essential for being able to empathize and care about others. Most parents teach their children some version of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. A phrase I often heard growing up was, put yourself in that person's shoes. Phrases like these only have meaning if you understand that other children are people just like you, if you understand that their perspectives are different than yours, and if you actually have the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes. A child with a heavily impaired theory of mind can't do these things. Because theory of mind affects our ability to understand individual people and how they think and feel, it also affects our ability to understand larger and more abstract things that are based on individual people, such as society, politics, laws, ethics, and history. Understanding people and social relationships is necessary in order to have reasonable ideas about how society works, why we have the laws and morals that we do, the lessons we should learn from history, and the political positions we should take. Without an adequate theory of mind, and therefore an adequate understanding of human nature, a person's ideas about society and morality can become highly distorted. One of the elephants in the room in the Manassian case is that a disproportionately large minority of mass murderers, incels, and members of the alt-right identify as having autism, or are believed to have autism. 
We're not sure why this is, and there isn't much published research on the subject yet, but one theory that's being advanced is that autistic people are more vulnerable to being radicalized by online communities like incels, and their impaired theory of mind may be a contributing factor in why they aren't able to realize that the ideas they see there are wrong. This is a theory I'm inclined to agree with, for which I'm going to make my case. In order to be able to explain this, I need to explain more about how theory of mind develops and how an impaired theory of mind can affect someone with autism. We'll begin at early childhood development. Simon Baron Cohen, the guy who designed the eye test, also designed a test for autism that was mentioned during Manassian's trial when his theory of mind was being discussed. The test is called the Sally Ann task and is designed to measure theory of mind in children that are around four years old. A therapist will show a child two dolls, Sally and Anne. They'll then show the child a scenario with the two dolls. There will be a room for the two dolls that has a box and a basket in it. Sally takes a marble and places the marble in the basket. She then leaves. While she's away, Anne takes the marble out of the basket and places it in the box. Sally comes back into the room. The therapist will then ask the child, where will Sally look for the marble? A child with normal theory of mind will answer that Sally will look for the marble in the basket. The child will realize that Sally didn't see Anne move the marble into the box, so Sally will expect the marble to be in the basket. A child with impaired theory of mind will answer that Sally will look for the marble in the box. This is because the child knows that the marble is in the box and doesn't understand that Sally has a different perspective than he does. Now, it may be hard to imagine what it's like to be the child with the impaired theory of mind. One question we might ask is, if the child doesn't know what Sally's perspective is, why would he just automatically assume that Sally has the same perspective that he does? Well, the human mind naturally tries to find patterns or points of reference in things it doesn't understand. When a person is confronted with something that appears to have a will of its own and that they don't understand, like machines, animals, or natural forces, their natural inclination is to project their own thoughts and feelings onto it, to imagine that what they don't understand thinks and feels in the same way that they do. When this is done to something that isn't human, it's known as anthropomorphization. Our ancestors lived in a world where they understood very little about why nature worked the way it did. They believed natural disasters like storms, earthquakes, and floods were caused by gods or spirits, which often looked human and had very human ways of thinking and behaving. The Greek gods are an example of this. However, even if you think gods or spirits are real, this doesn't really make sense. Why would a god or gods think and act like humans? Why wouldn't they be something that isn't human at all and is impossible for us to understand? We can also see this in our images of the Christian god, who is often shown as an old man in the clouds. As the Greek philosopher Xenophanes famously said, if horses could draw, their gods would look like horses. We can see the same thing at work in science fiction, where alien species often look human and act in very human ways. We can also see this with the way people treat pets, imagining that dogs and cats have human feelings and intentions, even though this might not necessarily be true. We can even sometimes see this with the way people treat objects. Someone who's angry when his car breaks down might kick it and swear at it. Human beings evolved to be social animals, and we naturally see the world in terms of social relationships, even when this might not make sense. Now, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent here, but the point I'm trying to make is that it's normal for people to look at the actions and behaviors of others and to respond to things they don't understand by filling in the gaps with their own thoughts and intentions, what they think they would think or do in that situation. The problem here is that people with impaired theory of mind aren't able to understand a sizable amount of what other people do or why. Their response may be then to assume that other people think the same way they do, want the same things they do, or even have the same knowledge that they do. We see this with children who answer incorrectly in the Sally Ann task. To a person with autism who has an impaired theory of mind, other people may be just as incomprehensible as earthquakes and floods were to our ancestors, or as an alien species might be to us now. Indeed, many people with autism often feel like they were born on the wrong planet, and that the world of normal people is incomprehensible to them. So, the kind of response we see in the Sally Ann task can be seen as a normal response to an abnormal problem. Now, suppose someone with an impaired theory of mind doesn't get help and continues to grow up with this problem. Other people will be incomprehensible to them. They'll grow up in an environment where, much like our ancestors, they don't understand why most of the things around them are happening. If many of their experiences are negative, this will make those experiences more painful for them, and they'll want answers. This is complicated by the fact that an impaired theory of mind, as well as the other impairments that people with autism can have, can cause a person to become isolated and therefore cut off from people who could give them information about how to socialize or how the world works. If a child's social skills and theory of mind lag behind those of their peers, they'll likely be rejected by them and won't make many friends. This will further stunt their social development and can create a vicious cycle where they don't have the needed social skills and understanding, so they don't socialize with people, so they don't develop the needed social skills and understanding, and things will just continue to get worse and worse as they get older. It may be bizarre to look at a 28-year-old man and hear that he's been assessed as having the social sophistication of a young child, but if he spent his whole life being shunned, this could make sense. Where would he have gotten the help and information he needs? This brings us to the online radicalization part of the problem. 
Real-life people aren't the only sources of information about social interaction, human nature, or society. As a child's ability to think and reason grows, they'll be able to gather information from things like books, movies, TV shows, video games, and the internet. If the child is isolated, he may not have much more than that. If his social development has been stunted, he may not be able to understand how inaccurate and toxic some of the things he sees are. He won't be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were. I've been to incel communities like incels.co, for example, and they are frequently dominated by a small number of people who make huge numbers of posts, and for whom incel forums are their primary means of social interaction. Their peer group consists almost solely of people who've had similar experiences as them and have come to very similar conclusions. Incel forums tend to ban women, as well as people who join them with the intention of helping them by giving them life advice. So, they're kind of an echo chamber. They only allow in people who go along with the dominant narratives. Someone with a limited and negative experience of society who comes into one of these forums searching for answers and sees numerous people with the same experiences who've reached the exact same conclusions, and only those people, might come to think that what incels think and believe is normal. We see this kind of problem at work in hate groups of all kinds, and you don't necessarily have to have autism to fall victim to it. If you look at white supremacists, for example, their ideas about black people come about in a similar way. They often have limited and largely negative experiences of black people, and they surround themselves with other white people with the same beliefs and experiences. They spend huge amounts of time talking about how awful black people are and showing news reports and cherry-picked information that reinforces their ideas. They tend to be very insular, and their communities reinforce the belief that most of society is corrupt and stupid, and that they are some of the few people who have discovered the truth about the way the world works. Incels have a similar idea with the concept of the black pill, which means discovering the hidden and ugly truth about what women are really like, and how it's impossible for certain men to be able to have relationships or be accepted by society. Whereas white supremacists blame the Jews for all of the world's problems, incels blame feminism, and also, sometimes, the Jews. There's a bit of overlap between the alt-right and incels, which Alec Manassian points out to the detective in his interrogation video. The Stacey's going for the child. Exactly. The Stacey's are the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the dizzy, dumb girls dating the, the goofy, you know, jocks. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So you call them Stacey's and Chad's. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard that term before. Uh, and so that's in the alt-right? Yes. That conversation takes place in the alt-right as well? Yes. Many of the people who fall victim to these kinds of ideas are isolated young men. One of the theories advanced by people who study the link between autism and extremism is that the isolation and theory of mind impairments that can be experienced by people with autism make them more likely to buy into extremist ideas, as they're less likely to have the life experience and insight needed to realize that they're wrong. One thing I've consistently seen on forums like incels.co is people who think about women only in terms of what they want from them, and who don't seem to realize that women are actually people. There are many reasons why a person might come to think this way. After all, women weren't legally considered people in Canada until 1929. You don't have to have autism to buy into the ideas of hate groups. Many people without autism do, and have, throughout our history. Unfortunately, there are still many misconceptions about autism, which have given some people an exaggerated view of how vulnerable people with autism are to radicalization by groups such as incels. There are people who think that people with autism have no theory of mind at all, and that we basically see women in the same way they might see a toaster or an isosceles triangle. This is false. Autism is a spectrum, and there's a range of impairment that a person can have, but we usually do have empathy and theory of mind. There are plenty of people with autism who are able to have relationships with women and who don't treat them like objects. However, empathy and theory of mind are harder for us to develop, and we're more likely to be socially isolated as a result, all of which can make us more vulnerable to being radicalized. There's still some doubt about the extent of Alec Manassian's radicalization. Was he truly an incel, or was he just taking on the mantle of incels to create more of an impact? This will be the subject of my next video, but for now, let's take a look at some of the incel ideas Alec Manassian talks about in his interrogation, and the flaws in theory of mind that he would have to have in order to believe them. It's basically a movement of angry uh, incels, such as myself, who are unable to get laid. Therefore, we want to overthrow the uh, chads, mm -hmm. which would uh, force the Stacys to be forced to uh, reproduce with the incels. And we were plotting a certain uh, timed strikes mm -hmm. on society in order to um, confuse and uh, shake the foundations, just to put all the uh, normies in a uh, state of panic. Okay, and who would be a normie? Uh, normie means uh, normal people. That would be anyone who is uh, considered to be uh, normal by uh, the unfair standards of society. But not the Chads or Stacys. Chads and Chads Stacys, and Stacys are actually above normies, or at least they think they're above normies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, all right. And so as a result, even the playing field. Yes. The you know they they uh, they convert the Stacys and Chads from living to dead, and, and to so make so that we come out on us to on top. So the the targets, who are the targets for the this uprising be? All of the uh, alpha males. All the alpha males. So the Chads. Yes. So that's those are the people you that that, that you want to kill. Yes. Okay. All right. And who else? Any uh, uh, any of the Stacys who uh, do not wish to uh, give their love and affection to the incels. So they they you, they're a target as well. Yes. To be killed. Yes. Okay. And what about the normies? No, uh, yeah, norm, normies. Yes, we uh, do. We do. We don't necessarily wish to uh, kill the normies, but we do wish to uh, subjugate them uh, in order to make them understand that the. Um, that our type is uh, the more superior one. Right, right. So when you say subjugate, what do you mean by that? Mean, meaning uh, either imprison them or put them in a lower position in society. Okay. All so right. that they acknowledge um, the incels or the uh, Pepe the Frog types as the more superior ones. So here he is talking about Chads and Stacys and incels and all of this weird 4chan stuff as if it's totally normal and reasonable. To a normal person, what he says in the video about Chads and Stacys is going to sound insane. Yet, take a moment to reflect on why you think that he's wrong. One of the answers you'll probably come up with is that you know plenty of women who aren't Stacys. Well, it appears that Alec Manassian didn't. He grew up isolated and, as far as I'm aware, had no female friends and no women in his life other than his mom. Another answer you'll probably come up with is that it's absurd to think that everyone in society neatly falls into the caricatures of Chads, Stacys, Normies, and incels. The reasons for believing this are, again, going to be based on your own experiences of other people. You'll have met people that aren't like this, and you'll have been able to figure out that they're not like this by being able to understand their thoughts and motivations. Manassian, and others like him because of their level of social impairment, aren't going to have as many social experiences with anyone that are more than superficial. They're also not going to have very many social experiences in general. In other words, they may not have seen enough of other people and the world in order to know that the incel ideology is wrong. And what they actually do see is something they may not be able to properly interpret or understand because of their impaired theory of mind. For example, you might see a young, attractive college girl walking down the street, someone an incel would consider a Stacy, and realize that you have no idea who she is or what she's done in her life. She might have slept with many men or none at all. She could be someone who spends her free time volunteering at a homeless shelter and helping children with autism, or someone who likes to smoke crack using money she stole from her parents. She could be someone who has a lot of sympathy for incels or someone who despises them and wants them to suffer. She could be one of the best people in your community or one of the worst. You have no idea. You might also look at someone like 94-year-old Betty Forsyth and ask yourself, what did she do to deserve to die? Is she or was she a Stacy? And even if she was, why would she deserve what Alec Manassian did to her? Alec Manassian also killed men, which raises the question, what if they had been incels too? Alec Manassian didn't know if they were incels or not. He didn't know anything about his victims at all. In order to be able to ask questions like these, you need to be able to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's very different from you, and imagine what it's like to be them. You need to know what sorts of things are within the range of normal human behavior, and be able to make inferences about what a certain person may or may not be like, as well as what they're probably like. Someone whose theory of mind is impaired enough can't do these things. Like the child in the Sally Ann task, all they'll be able to imagine is what they think and what they feel and how they see the world. They can't imagine a world that exists outside of their own perspectives and expectations. Now, let's think about Alec Manassian. If you look at his entire interview, as well as all of the information about him that's come out in the trial so far, you'll see a staggering lack of insight. He understands what it's like to be an incel and about the oppression that people like him feel. He understands the goals and objectives that incels have. Yet at no point does he ever seem to have asked himself, what's it like to be a Chad? What's it like to be a Stacy? Why do people become Chads and Stacys? What are their goals and objectives, and why do they have them? Are there other reasons why women would have rejected me other than them being Stacys? What if I'm wrong about some of the things I believe? How can I be certain that I know what society is like when I've seen so little of it? Do people really deserve to die because I can't get laid? And what if I get what I want and overthrow society and Stacys are forced to sleep with incels? Is that fair or right? Would I want that to happen to my mother, my sister, or my daughter? Much like Elliot Roger, Alec Manassian only sees other people in terms of their connection to him. Those women who rejected me are making me miserable, so I hate them, and I want to hurt them. It doesn't seem to have occurred to him that they have their own entire lives that exist outside of him and what he wants, and that they have just as much of a right to live their lives and pursue what they want as he does. 
Now, it's entirely possible that Alec Manassian's deficiencies in theory of mind helped prevent him from being able to realize the flaws in his beliefs, and in those of incels in general. It's entirely possible that they helped prevent him from realizing that his victims were people just like him who didn't deserve to die. It's entirely possible that without the limitations of his autism, Alec Manassian might have had the good sense not to do what he did. We don't know whether these things are true, and they're impossible to prove. One other theory that's been suggested is that Manassian's unwillingness to examine the flaws in his own thinking is the result of narcissism rather than ignorance. Manassian wasn't diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, so if he is narcissistic, it would have to be subclinical. This would certainly line up with many of the things he said and done. He left hostile messages to his classmates on Slack, he considered himself a supreme gentleman, and he's solely concerned with his own image and what he wants. And you have a problem with the women that date these fellows? Yes. Why is it that you have a problem with, with the women? Because I feel that uh, it's illogical to be uh, dating such men when they could be dating a gentleman instead. Right, right, right. That makes sense. Because I considered myself a supreme gentleman, right. I was angry that, that they would um, give their love and affection to obnoxious brutes. Really, really. I uh, started thinking that it's unfair that um, a s certain uh, guys will not get any uh, love and affection from girls. Okay. And, and what, 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 what do you mean by certain guys? Such as me, that are, uh, that are very uh, nice and uh, act gentlemanly. His anger at being rejected by women and his difficulties with work and school could have produced a narcissistic injury, which would provide a motivation for revenge. We may never be certain of all of the things that are wrong with Manassian or which disorder caused him to do what. However, for the purpose of determining Manassian's guilt, this is largely irrelevant. In order for a finding of NCR to be made, Manassian has to be someone who is incapable of understanding that what he did was morally wrong. His theory of mind has to be impaired enough for him to not understand that what he did would hurt people. However, he's given us all a rather sizable amount of evidence that he did understand what he did was wrong, that he did understand what he did would hurt people, and that that was the point. His theory of mind was impaired, but not impaired enough to deceive other people, and not impaired enough to fail to understand that his attack would be harmful. First, let's look at the instances in which we know Manassian lied to people. Being able to deceive others requires theory of mind, as you have to be able to understand what another person is thinking and expects in order to come up with something that will fool them. People with autism are often bad at lying because their theory of mind is more impaired than that of their peers. People with autism also often have very rigid ideas about what's right and what's wrong, and are obsessive about following all of the rules that they think are important. I was very bad at lying to people when I was a kid, and it was hard for me to accept that being able to function in society as an adult requires you to lie sometimes. I've always hated doing it, and I try to avoid it when I can, which often comes at the expense of maintaining social harmony. This is a common experience that people with autism have. Now, a small child will try to deceive people, but he will often do a bad job of it because his theory of mind isn't advanced enough and he isn't able to put himself in the shoes of the person he's lying to. Here's an adorable example of this I found on YouTube of a toddler lying to his mother. John, what are you eating? Okay. You didn't eat anything. Yeah. Okay. John, look at mommy. Open wide, let me see. Really, you didn't have any snacks. John? Can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Well, they're not empty. John, look at me. They're not empty. Did you eat those sprinkles? No. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. Oh, um, no. No. I did not eat sprinkles. I did not. You can see some of the issues here. Manassian, however, is a bit more sophisticated than this. For example, when he rented the van from the Ryder rental company, he lied to the employee he spoke to about why he wanted the van. I just um, said, hey, how are you doing? I was interested in uh, renting a truck. I uh, told him that I wanted to just help a friend move furniture around. The fact that Alec Manassian lied to the Ryder employee about what he was going to do with the van, coming up with the innocuous sounding false story of wanting to help a friend move furniture around, indicates that he knew what he was going to do was wrong. After all, if he didn't, why would he lie about it? In order to be able to do this, he had to know that the employee would view mass murder as wrong and might try to stop him if he found out that's why he wanted the van. He also had to know that the employee would view helping a friend move furniture as something that isn't wrong and a plausible reason for wanting to rent a van. This requires some theory of mind to be able to do, something that a child who failed the Sally Ann task could not do. Manassian also lied about how he got to the Ryder building where the van was located. He initially told the detective that he took the bus there, but later admitted that his father Vahi had driven him there when the detective confronted him about this. 
If I was to suggest to you that we received information that somebody dropped you off there, would I be right? I don't wish to answer that. In terms of how you got to the rider dealership, were you telling me the truth or not? Yes, I was telling the truth. You were telling me the truth as to how you got there? Yes. You're not lying? No. So in other words, the truth is you caught the, the bus? Yes. The truth is that you did not get dropped off by somebody? Correct. Why is it that we would receive information? I... Um, sorry? I can't think of a reason why. I'm going to be straight up with you. Your dad has told us that he dropped you off at a Starbucks coffee shop earlier today or earlier yesterday. Yes, that is what happened. Okay. He also told the detective why he lied to him. So why wouldn't you tell me that? Because I was worried that you would think he was an accomplice. Okay. I, I don't he was not aware of this. Okay. I, and I believe you. I believe you would say that. Okay. So he lied to protect his father as he was worried that the detective would think he was involved in the attack. This requires Manassian to be able to understand the possible states of mind of the detective, that he might think Manassian's father was involved if he found out he drove him to the van rental place. It also requires Manassian to think about what the detective might think about what his father thinks, so he's able to imagine another person trying to put himself in the shoes of someone else. He knows that this is something other people do and is able to imagine what that's like. This act of deception also demonstrated empathy. Manassian was worried about his father being harmed and didn't want that to happen. He cared about what happened to his father, but not about what happened to his victims. So Manassian does have some empathy, both cognitive and affective. He's just being selective about applying it. Manassian also lied to his father about what he was going to do when he dropped him off. Okay, so that was a lie. Correct. Okay, so what did you tell your dad? Why did, you know, what did you tell your dad? That, I that told him I was meeting up with a friend. And what, what's your friend's name? Brandon Levine. Okay. And, and what was the purpose for this meeting? What did you tell your, your dad the purpose of this meeting to be? Uh, just to be able to um, catch up on old times, talk with each other, and chat. Again, this demonstrates that Manassian knew that his father would think mass murder is wrong. This suggests that Manassian knows this is something people in general, and not just Ryder employees, think is wrong. He also told his father a story where he was going. He wanted to go to a place near the van rental building where he was going to meet a friend. Again, this is a plausible and benign story, so his father believed him. However, we can see many instances in which Manassian lied and did a bad job of it, much of which I think could be attributed to poor theory of mind. One thing I noticed that was interesting is that he gave very short answers to many of the detective's questions when he was lying. Yes. No. Correct. He often talks like that when he's being truthful, but if you listen, you'll notice that he speaks more quickly and you can hear hesitation in his voice when he does it. Uh, this is often what small children do when they lie because they're nervous and aren't clever enough to hide it and come up with more convincing answers than just yes or no, which is what we saw the toddler who ate all the sprinkles do. There were also other lies he told that show he's not very good at putting himself in other people's shoes. Here's a story Manassian told the detective about being rejected by women at a Halloween party. Was there one particular moment in your life where it sort of struck home? This was a problem, or was it just a... Uh... On Halloween of 2013, I was attending a house party, mm -hmm. and I uh, walked in and attempted to uh, socialize with some uh, girls. Uh, however, they all uh, laughed at me and uh, held the arms of the uh, big guys instead. Really? Yeah. In his testimony during the trial, Manassian's father claims that this couldn't possibly have happened because Manassian was too isolated. He didn't even have the confidence to talk to waitresses at restaurants. Now, if you're familiar with Elliot Rogers' manifesto, you'll know that the type of experience Manassian describes is something that Roger experienced and complained about frequently. Elliot Roger was short and scrawny and was very insecure about this from the time he started high school. He talks about starting his first day of high school and being horrified at how huge his peers were compared to him. He talks about women not being attracted to him because of how short and small he was and that they chose to be with the big guys instead. However, there's one thing Manassian says that doesn't make sense. Elliot Roger was not a big guy, so this would make sense for him to say. However, Alec Manassian is a big guy. He's both tall and stocky. 
This is something that would make no sense for him to say. I think the detective picked up on this because he appears to get suspicious after Manassian says it. Throughout his interview, Manassian repeats word for word many of the things that Elliot Roger says in his manifesto and in his YouTube videos. He's trying to be like Elliot Roger, yet it didn't occur to him that this particular type of experience wouldn't apply to him because he's a big guy and Elliot Roger wasn't. This could indicate an impaired theory of mind, and I'm inclined to agree with the idea that this story didn't happen. Manassian also claims to have spoken with Elliot Roger prior to committing his attack. Not only is this highly improbable, but the story is easily verifiable as being false. Here's what Alec Manassian had to say about that. So how did you learn of Elliot? Because on, um, on the, we uh, private messaged each other on uh, Reddit yep. after I saw one of uh, his posts mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we just uh, talked about each other and got to know each other and we found each other very interesting. We both had the same uh, frustrations at society. Reddit was the first place we uh, communicated. Oh, okay. And was it uh, f forever alone? Yes. In that in that subgroup. Yes. Okay. Uh, and did you ever communicate uh, on any other medium or platform? Uh, other than Reddit and 4chan, no. no. So you didn't Skype or call on the phone or anything like no. that. No, we used uh, code names actually. Okay. What was it, what were they? Uh, Elliot Roger was named of Valtharion. Valtharion. Yes. How do you spell that? V a l t h a r i o n. Okay. And uh, what was Chris uh, Harper Mercer's name? Space robot. Space robot. One word or two? Uh, one word. One camel word. case. So according to his story, Alec Manassian only communicated with Roger on Reddit, and Roger went by the username Valtharion. Here's the Reddit user page for Valtharion. We can see that he posted after Elliot Roger died, so this can't possibly have been him. After the van attack, Valtharion posted a thread on Reddit saying that he wasn't Elliot Roger and that he found the situation amusing, which I remember seeing but haven't been able to find for this video, so I guess he deleted it. Manassian also claimed that Chris Harper Mercer went by the username Space Robot on Reddit, yet when we look for the user Space Robot, we see exactly the same thing. Alec Manassian wasn't able to realize that this is something that would be easy for the detective to determine was false, which an intelligent person with a normal theory of mind probably would have. One thing to remember is that Alec Manassian had a long time, in both the time before the attack and the time after he was arrested, to plan what he was going to say. So why did Alec Manassian make these things up? Dr. Westfall believes this is because he wanted to become more notorious and thought that associating himself with the incel movement and Elliot Roger would make this happen. Now, we don't know whether this is true, but let's suppose that it is. This requires Manassian to be able to understand that society would view his attack as more heinous if he associated himself with Elliot Roger and the incel movement. He would have had to have sat down and said, okay, what can I make society think that will do the most damage and cause as much chaos and suffering as possible? His predictions about this, as we now know, were accurate. There's a difference between predicting the state of mind of a single person that you're interacting with and predicting the state of mind that people in general are likely to have. This is a higher order use of theory of mind that requires abstract thinking and an understanding of what people in general think and value. Being able to do this would require Manassian to know that society views mass murder and misogyny as wrong and to be able to understand what effect it would have upon society for him to advocate for and do these things. If what Westfall believes is true, then this is further evidence that Manassian has some theory of mind and some understanding of the difference between right and wrong. Here's Manassian talking about the impact he expected his attack to have. Okay, so what are you thinking about while you know, you're waiting to, to make these preparations, or waiting to rent the truck? Uh, the uprising. I was thinking that I would inspire uh, future masses to uh, join me in my uprising as well. I was using a code language to avoid uh, detection by the authorities. I, was, I stated that there will be a beta uprising tomorrow. I encourage others to uh, follow suit. Okay, okay. What were you thinking specifically? About how, uh, how the foundations of the world would be shaken by this event. Okay. And uh, when you say that, what do you mean by the foundations of this world? Meaning that I, 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 I was fairly confident that others would be inspired to uh, repeat the same actions as me, in basically just to uh, overthrow society. Okay, okay. Now, what are you thinking while you're in the van? Uh, I'm thinking that this is it. This is the day of retribution. Okay. And uh, anything else in your mind? 
Just that. That's okay. the, that's the only thing that's in my mind. It's just burning in my mind. Burning in your mind. Yeah. Okay. I mentioned in my previous videos that in the cases Dr. Westfall's research papers looked at where he thought people with autism should be found NCR, they were all cases where the person didn't know what they did was wrong. They didn't know that people or society would view their behavior as objectionable. This is not the case with Alec Manassian. Here he is saying that he knew society would be harmed by what he did, and that's why he did it. He wanted to shake society to its foundations and throw people into a state of panic by doing his van attack. In order for him to believe this, he would have to know that his attack would upset people. He would have to know that it was wrong. He didn't sit in the interrogation room and say, I did what I did because I was angry, and then display no knowledge of how he thought he would be perceived. Manassian also wanted to inspire other people to do the same thing he did, and made posts on 4chan and Facebook encouraging them to do this. This required him to be able to imagine the states of mind of other incels, people who have the same grievances as he does and might be inspired by seeing other people commit mass murder, just as he was inspired by Elliot Roger. We can also see some possible impairments in Manassian's theory of mind when he talks about some of the justifications for the attack. One of the things Manassian talked about in the interview was how society has unfair standards because it isn't okay to mistreat people because of things they can't control. Let's take a look. Then you kind of resent these girls, right? Yeah. Because, you know, that's kind of a superficial way of uh, deciding, you know, who it is because you're Because height is an unfair, you can't control your height. Right, exactly. What other things can't you control? You can't control uh, your looks either. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, what about um, like phys physical disabilities, right? Obviously, if you were blind or, you know... Unfortunately, you can't control that. Yeah, you can't control that. That's what I mean. So these are things you can't control or, um, you know, other disabilities. You know, if you're mentally handicapped or if you, uh, you, you know, you're... You have an amputee, or uh, uh, you know, there's there's other other things, and I and I and so so does that would would you include that in those those issues that you can't control? Yes. So here are all of the things Manassian and the detective talked about, which people can't control, and which it's unjust to mistreat them for. I find this reasonable. However, here are some other things people can't control: being women, being attractive, not having autism, not having mental health issues, not having poor social skills. You see where I'm going with this. Alec Manassian was able to look at his own life and realize it was unjust for him to be treated badly because of things he couldn't control. Yet, he wasn't able to apply the same reasoning to his victims and to realize that he was treating them badly because of things they couldn't control. He wasn't able to realize that what he did to them was every bit as unjust as what he thought society was doing to him, and that he was essentially becoming the thing that he hated, which had made him so miserable. We don't know why this is, but an impaired theory of mind may very well be the culprit here. Dr. Westfall kind of brought this issue up in his interview with Manassian. Manassian was bullied as a child, and Westfall said that other people might view him as a bully because of the van attack. Manassian was apparently aghast at this idea and wasn't sure how to process it. Some new information about Manassian's state of mind has also emerged in the Crown's cross-examination of Dr. Westfall. Transcripts were read out from Manassian's interviews with forensic doctors on Monday, in which he said, I quote, I was feeling very isolated and bitter at society, and I just decided to take out my anger on other people instead of dealing with it directly. I really wanted to do it, but then obviously, because it's such a big act, people don't normally do this. Obviously, I was hesitating. My parents might feel guilt. Where did I go wrong? Did I somehow lead to think this is okay? Why did he do this? I get it. I understand the impact, but I just really wanted to do it. He also said that if he was the child of one of his victims, he'd be grief-stricken, and that he'd feel a little guilty for the very young kids wondering why he killed their parents. Now, I may not be as qualified as Dr. Westfall, but this looks an awful lot like theory of mind and cognitive empathy, yet a near-complete lack of effective empathy, which would make him a sociopath. Westfall's argument is that, although Manassian can understand these things in a detached intellectual way, he has no deeper understanding of things like suffering and devastation. Yet, some of the things he told police suggests that he might have a bit of an idea. Manassian told the detective in his interview that he surrendered to police because he didn't want the arresting officer to hurt him. Uh, I actually told him that I had a gun in my pocket, which okay. was untrue. Right. Uh, then, I had to, I, twice I stuck my left hand in my uh, pocket and attempted to do this just to uh, provoke a, a reaction. Okay. Uh, that, uh, he... Unfortunately, he didn't react, right. so then I ended up being ordered to the ground. So I knew at that point, he's not going to shoot me, so uh, I've lost. So I, just, I had no choice but to just get on the ground. 
I realized I had no choice but to get on the ground because I was probably going to be uh, tackled anyways or tased. And if I'm if I'm going to live, I'd rather not encounter physically a painful experience. So I decided I have no choice but to admit defeat at that point. Right. Okay. Another thing Alec Manassian told Westfall is that he wanted to be killed by police because he didn't want to go to prison. Curiously, he did not tell the detective this when he asked him why he wanted to be killed by police. So, Manassian understands that he can do things that will cause him to be hurt and to suffer, and will do what he can to avoid them because he doesn't want to experience pain and suffering. This requires someone to be able to know or at least predict what pain and suffering are like, and what can cause pain and suffering. Yet, Manassian was almost completely unconcerned with the pain and suffering he would cause his victims. What this shows is that Alec Manassian wasn't someone who couldn't conceive of pain and suffering. He could. But he only cared about what he and his family would experience. He didn't really care about anyone else. Are you suffering from any illnesses? Yes, I'm a murdering piece of shit. Whatever you want to call that, I don't think it's autism. So, we've looked at numerous flaws in Manassian's thinking that led him to want to commit the attack, and which enabled him to commit the attack when he decided to do so. They highlight some areas in which people with autism might need extra support to avoid being radicalized by groups like incels. They also suggest that Alec Manassian may have comorbid psychological issues that were salient in his offending. However, with all this in mind, should Alec Manassian's deficits in theory of mind and empathy make him not criminally responsible? As I explained in my first video, in Canada a criminal offense is divided into actus reus, the criminal act, and mens rea, the intention to commit a criminal act, or criminal intent. The legal question here is whether Alec Manassian can form the criminal intent to commit the van attack. Being able to form criminal intent requires you to be aware of the criminal act you are going to do and to know that it's wrong. The law assumes that everyone knows that a criminal act is wrong and is aware of what he's doing at the time, unless it's proven otherwise through a not criminally responsible defense. As I also explained in my first video, the vast majority of NCR cases involving people with learning disabilities concern people who don't understand that what they did was wrong and who don't have the mental capacity to understand the concepts of right and wrong. Alec Manassian understands that what he did was wrong, and he has the mental capacity to understand that things like helping a friend move furniture are right, and things like committing mass murder are wrong. The fact that it was wrong is one of the reasons he did it. He wanted to upset people. He wanted to shake society to its foundations and throw normies into a state of panic. He understands that hurting people because of things they can't control is wrong, yet chose to do it anyway. He understands that most people in society aren't incels and don't share his beliefs, yet chose to violently impose them on other people anyway. He felt a little guilty that he might kill the parents of young children and about the effect his attack would have upon his own family, but chose to do it anyway. He's someone who sat down and asked himself, how can I do as much damage to society as possible? And then he did it. His theory of mind may have been impaired, but he had enough to understand some of the negative effects his actions would have on others, and to manipulate the police, the public, and his family. His ability to feel empathy might have been impaired, but we saw that he had empathy for his father, and he arguably had empathy for other incels as well. This isn't a matter of him not having any empathy at all, or not having any theory of mind at all. Even after Manassian was imprisoned for his attack, he told Dr. Westfall that he wasn't sure if he would do it again or not, and wishes he had killed more young college-age women who were more like the Stacys that incels talk about. Uh, Dr. Westfall wants Alec Manassian to go to a mental hospital, where he can possibly be released one day. Yes, Alec Manassian has mental issues that prevented him from understanding some of the flaws in his reasoning, as well as some of the effects his actions would have on others. But so do lots of other people who were in jail. Jails are full of people who committed crimes because they wanted something, and who for whatever reason either didn't consider or didn't care about many of the effects their actions might have on others. They still go to jail anyway. They knew the difference between right and wrong, and they chose wrong. That's all that has to be determined. The flaws in their reasoning or empathy are irrelevant. Now. I'm not going to get up here and say that putting criminals in jail is always an ideal solution. Yet there are some people for whom putting them in jail until the day they die is the best option for the rest of society. Alec Manassian murdered 10 people in the streets of Toronto and injured 16 other people. He ran over old ladies, single mothers, and men, and only stopped because a drink got splashed on his windshield after he ran over the person carrying it. He repeatedly tried to encourage other incels to murder more people, in his statements on Facebook and 4chan, and in his statements to the police detective that he knew would be made public. Uh, judging by his statements to his doctors, he still wants to murder people. This past Sunday was the 31st anniversary of the Montreal Massacre, in which Mark Lapine walked into an engineering classroom and killed 14 women after saying that he thought they were all feminists, and that he hated feminists. For the past 31 years, Canadians have asked themselves how to prevent tragedies like this from happening. Here's one way I think we can do this. Send Alec Manassian to prison until the day he dies, and use the lessons learned from his life to help people who haven't committed mass murder yet. 
It's too late for Alec Manassian now, but there may be more people out there, autistic or not, who can be helped before they follow the path that he walked. It's a path that has led nowhere good, either for himself or anyone else. The media has spent and continues to spend a great deal of time demonizing incels. While the overwhelming majority of incels are not violent, there's a minority of people in the incel movement who quietly approve of what people like Elliot Roger and Alec Manassian have done, because they think it's the only way to get society to listen to their problems. We see the same problem with hate groups of all kinds, including the alt-right and Islamists. I've become very disillusioned with a lot of anti-racist and anti-misogynist activist groups because they operate heavily on demonization and virtue signaling. A lot of what they do consists of pointing their fingers and saying, these people are sexist and racist. Well, yeah, they know, and they don't care. So what else have you got? Not a whole heck of a lot, it seems. If there's one lesson we should have learned over the past couple decades, it's that, it's that doing everything in our power to demonize and censor people who say or do things we don't like doesn't make them go away. There are real problems in our society that are driving people into these communities and making people in them think that violence is the only way for their pain and marginalization to be noticed. We're always telling incels and white supremacists to look inward at their own flaws rather than at society. But we also need to do the same thing and ask ourselves, what are we doing as a society that can make young white men from middle-class families with college degrees and good job prospects want to support people like Alec Manassian, or to be like him? My childhood experiences were similar to those of many people in the incel movement, so I know a bit about what it's like to see things from their side of the fence. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Society has a massive amount of contempt for young men with social difficulties, and for people who have mental illnesses or learning disabilities. Many people are fine with supporting mental health or autism awareness in a disconnected way, where they can give money to advocacy groups and see the occasional inspiring video or poster, but when they have to interact with people like that in real life, all of that often goes away. I don't usually talk about my personal life on this channel, but I will say that the life I lived growing up was something I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. I think that creating more help and support for young men with social difficulties, as well as autism, would cause fewer people to join the incel movement and show the people in these communities that there are ways to solve their problems that don't involve violence. It would also help people in our society who are marginalized live happier and more productive lives. I can see no reason not to do this. Alec Manassian chose to address his problems with violence, and it's too late for him to get help now. Whatever verdict he gets handed down, whether it's a guilty verdict or NCR, will not be pleasant. He'll be spending this Christmas, as well as probably every other Christmas he ever has, in a prison cell by himself. He'll never be able to walk on the grass, enjoy a sunset, or sleep in a nice bed. Every day he has will follow a strict schedule. He'll never be able to just go out and go for a walk and do what he feels like doing. He'll never be able to hang out with friends, have a place of his own, or have any of the possessions or freedoms we all take for granted every day. He'll never have a girlfriend, he'll never get married, and he'll never have children. He did what he did because he couldn't get laid, and because of what he did, he will never get laid. All he'll be able to do is jerk off in his prison cell by himself. Imagine where you'll be 50 years from now, and what kind of a life you might have then. Maybe you don't know where you'll be 50 years from now, but we all know where Alec Manassian will be. Old and gray, in his prison cell, still jerking off by himself, because that's all he'll ever be able to do. I don't want this to be anyone's future, and it doesn't have to be. If you're an incel and you're watching this, you don't have to follow the path Alec Manassian has. There are people out there who understand what you're going through, and we're doing what we can to try and get you the help you need. It's not going to happen overnight, but important things rarely do. I just want you all to know that not all of society is awful. We're not all Chads and Stacys who are out to get you. Now, Dr. Westfall has finished testifying, and we've moved on to the Crown's experts and their assessments of Manassian, which I'll be covering in a future video about the trial. I was hoping to have gained a greater understanding of Westfall's motivations by hearing all of his testimony, but like many others, I've just been left with more questions than answers. I've spent a lot of time wondering what Dr. Westfall's motivations are for supporting an NCR defense for Alec Manassian. He seems to have a soft spot for people with autism who've gotten into trouble with the law because they don't understand social norms. Maybe he thinks this is a useful platform for him to pave the way for more compassionate treatment of people with autism by the criminal justice system. Yet, having read much of the research on the subject by both himself and his colleagues where people with autism got in trouble with the law, I think he could have found a better hill to die on than this. That's all for now, folks. This was a very long video and a very hard one to make, but my next videos about the trial should be shorter and less dense. Stay tuned.